Hey, what's up, guys? Arava here, and welcome back to the Pit Lane Podcast, episode number 126. It's been a bit of a while, I think uh, three weeks just about. I think the last podcast we did was just before the Belgium Grand Prix. We apologize for that. It's been a while. We have still been doing the instant race reactions, if you have seen those on my channel. But back with you as your host, myself, Callum, and Tom, uh, to talk about the Singapore Grand Prix, and also really just the last three races in general, I guess, of the Ferrari form coming in. Three Ferrari wins in a row, Leclerc, Leclerc, and then Sebastian. Ashton Vettel, and then looking ahead to the Russian Grand Prix. But let's talk about that very spicy Singapore GP. Obviously, myself and Tom reacted to it straight away, but we didn't get reaction from Cal of the whole, you know, Ferrari swapping, the 1-3 the, the that became the 1-2, and Sebastian Vettel finally winning a Grand Prix. The last one was the one actually us three all watched in person. Yep. So <laughs> we're kind of thinking, when is it going to come? Oh my God, have we wa watched like the last race Vettel's going to win for a long while? And lo and behold, he came through. But Cal, what, what did you make of that entire race, that whole top fight I guess I thought it was fascinating I think it was the first time that we saw the top six running line astern away from the rest of the field like with obviously the likes of Gasly being in the back of the field and then the odd driver in the top six as well being down the field it's the first time ever that we've seen the top six just run away with it but then not run away with it because they were running this weirdly slow pace that front running teams can do to save their tyres such as in the likes of Monaco um, because no one can overtake, and obviously it goes down to the age-old problem of not being able, able to overtake, but it was fascinating. I absolutely loved how Ferrari were dictating the strategy of the field, which is something you very rarely see, and it was very fascinating to see that they gave Vettel preferential treatment, bringing him in early, um, kind of being on the front foot with race strategy, and also seeing Mercedes trying something and failing. Like Usually, I've given a lot of praise to Mercedes more recently. They've been exquisite with their race strategy calls but this one did not pay off and it did seem like it didn't go down very well with either driver with Hamilton getting annoyed at the fact that he's gone from P2 to P4 and Bottas being told that he can't he's got he's got to run three seconds slower than his previous lap because otherwise he'll overtake Hamilton <laughs> it was very bizarre from uh, Mercedes and then you've got Red Bull who were just there and thereabouts Verstappen picking up the pieces and just picking up the points where he can and that was after a weekend where we went into thinking Ferrari, well, they're going to be third best after the last time out on a twisty circuit, which we were attended, which was Hungary, and Ferrari were nowhere. We visually saw how far behind yeah, Ferrari yeah. were. Yeah. And they dominated this Grand Prix, I think. I think both Leclerc and Vettel were very much on top of their racecraft and their ability this weekend, especially Vettel. With that, I think he drove a brilliant, brilliant race, and they have put a stamp on the second half of this season to say we're back and our car is ready to bang. Yeah, yeah well, I think it's, it's good. Really good for them. And um, it's also good for next season as well. If these upgrades do work, I'm, I'm still putting a question mark on them because like I said to Arav in the instant race reaction, I feel like there's only been one race with these upgrades and Singapore is a very unique slow circuit. So now we go to Russia a bit more of like a Mercedes style circuit with medium yeah, tight see how it goes. So now we'll see like, if it does well here, then I know it'll do well anywhere because you kind of got that balance. So uh, I guess we'll see, really. But overall, I agree. I think both drivers were absolutely on it. I think that's the best way to put it, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, you can see it with the way Sebastian Vettel, especially, was I think was driving around, uh, getting that traffic, like I mentioned, like you know the dive mm -hmm. to uh, dive on Gasly. I'm still thinking about that dive on Gasly. It's actually the more I think about it, like the more you look at it, it's actually such a yep. horrendous dive, and it could have actually ended in absolute tragedy. And yet he made it work, and it was very much like the Sebastian Vettel of old. Uh, obviously, there's now a bit of tension coming away from that Grand Prix, maybe in Ferrari between Leclerc. Leclerc was you know clearly verbally unhappy. You know he he kept on saying you know I know I understand I'm not gonna do anything stupid but I just want to let you guys know that uh, I don't understand how this has happened and I don't agree with how this has happened uh, you know he obviously mm -hmm. got undercut by his teammate I think Ferrari you know Bonotto did say afterwards that they just didn't realize I think how big the undercut was going to be there for Sebastian Vettel and how much time he was going to gain um, and you know we're, we're looking at you know the the crazy Mercedes uh, gamble and saying oh hang on could, could it work and then instantly Vettel pumped at that time that was two seconds fast than Hamilton he thought oh yeah no it's not going to work and you can clearly see why he's jumped Leclerc so I think it was maybe just a bit of 
potluck, like uh, myself and Tom kind of mentioned on the instant race reaction at the end of it. I don't think they intentionally, you know, really tried to get that swap done. I think it was more just like a strategic thing. And I think that's what they're going to tell Leclerc to kind of call them off. You know, strategically, like we said, they move from 1-3 to 1-2. So you can't complain really as a team. Obviously, that just shows Leclerc's fight. And it's great to see that because obviously, you know, you want him to have that, you know, cast your minds back to Australia when we started the season. And we, uh, us yep. three were talking about this whole kind of dynamic of Leclerc being the second driver or being told that Vettel's the senior man. Really not the case anymore. It really is kind of like, a, oh, okay, hang on. This kid wants to wants to fight. And so <laughs> Vettel, you're not going to get a lucky strategy like this every time. So are you going to buck up now? Use this win to bounce onwards. And uh, speaking about onwards, the Russian GP is going to be interesting, I think, because... Um, that fight between Ferrari and Merck and maybe Red Bull is going to be interesting because the Russian Grand Prix has tended to favour Mercedes uh, as of late. Um, and, you know, Ferrari generally hasn't gone amazingly there. And also Russia is a bit of a dull Grand Prix, shall we say. So if one team's ahead, I think they'll stay ahead. So I, d I don't know how, how it's going to go. It's going to really be about that long pace on, on practice. But do we think Ferrari are going to be there? Do, do, like, you know, just a wild guess from you two. Do, you, do you think they're going to be there with Merck at Russia? It's hard I think to so. tell. Uh, it, yeah, hard to tell. I think it can't go terribly wrong. Put it that way. I, I reckon they, they, they've up, their upgrades have worked, so there's no yeah. real reason for them to take them off. And they did say during the summer break, for the rest of the season, they're just going to throw on as much aero and like, bits onto the car as they can to try and compete. Yeah. So And Russia does I'm, have long a long main straight or kink, yep, kink and straight and a long back curve as it were so <laughs> yeah, yeah but yeah it's that. not straight but a back curve um so i feel like there's still because we saw at singapore if you compared the lap the onboard laps of leclerc and hamilton during that pole fight leclerc was still gaining so much on every straight um so that ferrari still re retained its power um, so I, I don't know. I, I have a kind of a good feeling about it, but obviously other pundits have already said after Singapore that calm down a little bit. They're not fully, fully ahead yet. You know, like like you mentioned, Tom, uh, Singapore is a very different circuit to Russia and the other circuits got going on, like Japan, et cetera, for etc. Is a high, higher speed corners. But then again, you kind of look at Spa. And Spa is high speed corners and they were able to pull it off there. So, I don't know, it's yeah, interesting. True. But it's, it's, it's definitely a good thing that this intrigue's come back because I think before the summer break, like Cal mentioned, at Hungary, we visually saw just how much of a turtle they were through the corners. Yeah. So it's, You've got to uh, remember uh, as well with the tyres, I think I, I read something on Crash.net saying that... I saw this as well. Um, they did... It was, I, don't, I can't remember what tyres they used in Hungary. The softest but they did of take the five. The, the, softest the softest to Singapore. But they were for Russia as well, probably, I think, because it's always... They a... will. I mean, it's quite hard to tell these days now because obviously I don't, I don't really pay attention anymore because I think that was just too much faff, that you, it was unnecessary information. But yeah, if yeah. you do <laughs> want to dive into it and understand it, yes, there were softer tyres in Singapore, the way they use them in the hotter climates. And you can maybe argue, obviously, less downforce on that Ferrari means they use their tyres less. Generally, they don't put them through as much strain. Um could have been potentially a reason i mean y it could be a, a various amount of reasons i don't think ferrari will be leading the pace in russia i think it's going to be close with mercedes it's very bizarre because like you look at mercedes and you compare them to a year ago in yeah. singapore and they were reasonably comfortable like but the thing is it's like the top three inverted so Mercedes and Ferrari pretty much switched places. Ferrari then became the quickest instead of, and the Mercedes went the slowest. So it's quite hard oh. to judge going into Russia what it is. But you do have to look at the characteristics of Russia. The, the, it's not just the fact that there's two long straights. The whole track is straight, if you think of it. It's just <laughs> knitted together with 90-degree yeah. corners. It's a very flat circuit, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's very, it's very much designed for the strengths of both cars, with the straights for the Ferrari and the corners for the Mercedes. It's very much, I think, an even balance. Here's, here's a, I want to try and get like a few, rattle through a few points here real quick. So, in Singapore, yes, the Ferrari's quicker in Sector 1, but if you look at the Deltas, they were actually still matching, crucially matching, through Sectors 2 and 3. So, it wasn't just they were getting the speed and then kind of relying on that to keep their lap time above board. You know, they, they were matching Mercedes and Red Bull through sectors two and three, yeah. which was quite surprising. Um, also for Russia as well, worth mentioning, Mercedes were meant to bring upgrades to the Japanese Grand Prix at Suzuka, which is the one after. Yeah, but right. because of Ferrari's sudden spurt, like the surge of form, they're going to actually fast track them to this race. So Mercedes will have upgrades on the car this weekend, which could be interesting. 
And ultimately, I'd say they're still the fa- they're still the favourites because obviously they've won pretty much every race this year, so it's hard to bet against Mercedes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we know Ferrari can be inconsistent sometimes. It's worth mentioning as well. This track last season was the one when Ferrari's mysterious sudden drop off of pace occurred for the first time when you know everyone expected you know the Ferrari to be on the pace, and there was this whole controversy about Ferrari and the engine mode and stuff, and they. People wonder if they turned the engine down last season or something because they weren't on the pace around here. You know, like everyone expected them to. Yeah. So um, again, the, there's kind of that unwritten storyline as well. Of will Ferrari this time be more competitive? I c- we know they've got that power advantage in qualifying as well, which is going to be very important, especially. What What happened in last year's Russian Grand Prix? I'm trying to think back. It was Mercedes won two. For, Vettel was trying to cling on, and then Vettel got the undercut come out in between the two Mercs with Bottas leading. Was it the Hamilton one where third? Was it the one and where then there was team orders? Oh yeah, mm. and Bottas had to let Hamilton win the race. Yeah, and this is what was. I was getting onto. Oh to. yeah, this is what this is what I was getting onto. In Singapore, um, people say about the Ferrari internal conflict going like going on. I thought it was quite nicely resolved, to be honest. And I think I no, didn't think Leclerc yeah, will understand. Over, no, no, no they will understand. Leclerc will understand the reason why because it was the only way for I could get a one-two. However, Mercedes, on the other hand, very interesting because Bottas was already. I want to say peed off. I'm not going to swear, but he was already frustrated with Hamilton on Saturday because I don't know if you saw what happened in Q3, um, running up towards the final corner when everyone was going really slow. Hamilton overtook Bottas going into the final corner, so Bottas had to slow down even more. Oh, and right. he called him an idiot, basically. <laughs> um, and that already kind of irked him because right. it ruined Bottas' final run in qualifying. Yeah. And then in the race, obviously Bottas done the strategy of coming in earlier than Hamilton and James on the radio said, I'll pay you back, he said. So maybe, let's say Bottas is leading or is, is second place this weekend, is I'll pay you back referring to Hamilton will let you win this one if you're in a position to maybe or switch around mm-hmm. again or, you know, because how will James yeah. pay Bottas back? You know, because it didn't happen I in Singapore. I don't think he will pay him back, <laughs> quite honestly. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. The problem is with Bottas this season is he had one good race. He's just not, he, he's not quick enough, is he, to warrant no. any sort of treatment like this? Versus the Hamilton. problem is they're better to... This is the thing, and I think Bottas said it on the radio. Bottas was like, well, it was Hamilton's choice to stay out. Like yeah. He was like, well, it's your choice to keep Hamilton out there. Yeah, exactly. But the problem is, is Hamilton can pull off these strategies. Like, he can stay on this option tyre and be like, keep me out, keep me out. Just, I'll just try and stay me out, and I'll try and get as much life out of these tyres as possible. Because he's done so well to either A, save them, or he should be really good at eking out those tyres. And then he's really good at then transferring that into the next stint. How many times have we seen Bottas in one stint be really good and then in one stint be yeah, dreadful? Be nowhere, yeah. It's usually at the, yeah. start of the, stint, the start of the race where he's a bit off. But th- this is what I don't quite understand. Like, I, th- I do feel for Mercedes because they're just like, well, Hamilton's going to do something. Bottas, I mean, okay, you've got to give Bottas the opportunity, but... But, I mean, he hasn't had. Where do you he draw hasn't the line? really. Yeah, where do you draw the line here? Because Hamilton's the one that's going to be challenging. I'm just saying, in terms of internal conflict, I think Ferrari resolved it quite nicely because there was a good reason for it. With a Mercedes, I think Bottas will feel like, okay, so he messed up my qualifying, nothing happened. I could have done something in the race, they didn't let me. You know, they said, yeah. come me back. Yeah. And last year at Russia, I had to give Hamilton the win. So, like, where's my. Yeah. You know no, what? Bottas just leaks Barrichello. He does, yeah. He's, it does, he does. It's the same energy. It really is the same energy. It totally does, is. Hasn't got the balls to really say anything. No. Because he's well, not going to get I think much he, better. I think he might say stuff behind the scenes, but I don't think anyone cares. That's the thing. Like, you I know. think he might now because he's penciled in for next year. Whereas this time last year he wasn't, I don't think. But the so. thing is, right, this is the thing as well, because Bottas is still sucking in the championship, isn't he? Uh, yeah. yeah. Somehow. So, like... On paper, there's no reason for them to have team orders because Bottas is still technically within the championship. But because Hamilton is so far ahead in the championship, everyone's kind of writing it off anyway. Yeah. yeah. So this is the weird thing. It's like, well, Mercedes are just inflicting team orders on themselves, even though yeah. it's like it's like them inflicting <clears throat> team orders on Hamilton and Rosberg back when they were fighting and Rosberg or Hamilton being so far behind the other. Mm-hmm. So it's 
I do genuinely think that Bot- Bottas is just Mercedes's bitch at the moment. The whipping boy. Yeah, no, t- entirely. Which is why I've just, I've just never agreed with signing him on again because for them it makes sense, obviously, but it's just it's quite the boring option, frankly. Yeah, but it's the same reason why they didn't sign Ocon because they they're quite happy. Yeah, with exactly. That they, they they like having balance. that that whipping boy. They like having a whipping boy. It's I wouldn't I mean, even, look, look I wouldn't call it balance. Season. I'll just call it <laughs> just outweigh to Hamilton, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, look at Friday this season. You know, he drafted a young driver who could potentially upset the Apple Car a bit and. Yeah. you know the balance of the team yeah. so far Ferrari have uh, done a great you know, great job of managing that I think um, you know why though is because Leclerc uh, uh, yeah, is ish, so I'd, I'd be level headed yeah no he, he, he reacted maturely so you know it was I was very impressed with how he reacted because there was a point where I was thinking to myself okay just remember you are still driving for Ferrari here so like no one's bigger than the team and he took it really well in the sense that, that line, he's still he's, not going to do yeah, this he still reasserted Ferrari. himself saying like I'm not happy about this you know, this ain't this is this isn't on, but I understand. And you know, for the sake of Friday, I'm not going to do anything stupid. And um, overall, it was very mature man. from him, and I really, really liked it. You know, that like he said, you know, don't, I am keeping my head down. Don't worry, that's fine. It's just I'm met, I'm letting my feelings known because I don't agree with it. And you know, that's fair enough. Yeah. But again, like we said in the instant race reaction, I don't think there was no other way of them getting a one-two other than no, that. no, no. Because it's, it's I a good- saw. Go on, go on. It's, it's a good, it's a good learning curve for him, I think, as a driver. Yeah. Like he needs to go through an experience like this because you're always going to get that. Uh, you know, every driver's had this experience where they've they've effectively lost a win maybe because of strategy. And it's like it's like one of those things that Leclerc's going to have to like build and just bank into. Like you know, you have these experiences of you know in your first few seasons. It's only his second season, remember? So it's one yeah. of those things you'll just bank in is like an experience of you know when it happens next, he can you know call upon it and remember to stay calm. And the fact he was already calm in the first instance, like you say, Tom, was uh, real real good. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning. An interesting stat, um, I'm not sure who the source is, but I saw it from WTF1, so I'll quote them for it. But um, the undercut delta on the hard tyres, which bear in mind is the middle of the, of the five compounds around Singapore, yep. um, the delta was around three seconds, but on the outlap, Sebastian gained 3.9. So the driver himself made the difference of nine tenths on the outlap, which if you look at the gap when they left the pit lane, may have just been the difference. So Ferrari might have actually just got it right, but Vettel's outlap was that good. He was that quick, and Vettel obviously was he was on, those... on it all weekend. If there's one yeah, exactly. thing that you've got to point on v- Vettel, though, is he was always got to get in that one lap, like that opening lap in, like in India in 2011 or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. That, that last and he's good on Q- three circuits, Q3 period. lap. Like, Actually, did you also see that uh, graphic that the uh, official that. F1 account made about yeah, street today. circuits? Yeah, yeah, I yeah, thought I that was it. brilliant. So Vettel has won the championship, inverted commas, for the street circuits so <laughs> far this year. Back so in he's, Monaco back, yeah, back in Singapore. Monaco and Singapore. I thought that was brilliant. I was, I was like, well, that does nod to him that he has, I think it was, he was first and then I think it was Hamilton second and Verstappen third, I believe. As far as I'm aware, yeah. but I thought that was a nice little nifty graphic just to kind of yeah. illustrate uh, Vettel's expertise around a, a street circuit, which was really good. Um, but I, honestly, I do think you watch. We're going to next weekend, and all media outlets are just going to be talking about team orders and inter team rivalry. I bet you. Yeah, That's no, uh, it's it's it's, e- it's easy. It's easy, low hanging fruit, isn't it? Just to talk about really um last bit of kind of singapore talk i want to talk about is uh some mad action that went on and this is kind of going back to a thing we've discussed as a trio before about the, ca- <coughs> the tv director man and you know someone leading him away from the camera booth um so the last lap obviously yeah i know hamilton was chasing verstappen down but there was a mad fight going on it was a four-way scrap between grosjean Sainz, stroll ricardo and we missed it completely it was on it wasn't on the tv we watched a replay afterwards and it's actually a madness of like going around singapore singapore sector two and they're going three wide into corners they're four cars literally to use the phrase i love in career modes you could throw a blanket over all of them because you literally could they were that close and we missed all of it and there's been some points being brought up recently about uh, i think fia even talked about it or fom talked about they're wanting to test out maybe picture in picture soon of, of of f1 so essentially you know you've got the main feed and then there's a little in picture picture of another mad scrap going on at the same time and i i'm just like can we hurry up and get that tested because 
uh, it's another bit of action. Like, what was it? Like France or like, uh, what, uh, what other races have we missed action basically at the end? Uh, well, because France was, uh, <clears throat> nothing happened in that race as far as I remember. Well, there was that mad fight at the end with Ricardo. True, we the missed mad fight it. at the end. And, we yeah, missed the it. The only thing that happened in We France missed it, didn't we? I'm trying to think this. I'm pretty sure in the last few races there have been plenty of uh, things we've missed uh, that I just can't remember the top been, of my head. But it's, you know what the problem is, obviously, I, like, I know from like a broadcasting point of view, like they want to focus on the the race winner and kind of yeah, give of course, of course, a yeah. big G up. But Tom, was it you that retweeted that thing earlier about what MotoGP uh, yeah. do yeah, with someone else the, that's my the time picture and picture sorry. on the timing tower, which I think was brilliant. I don't, yeah. I'd love to, MotoGP uh, do it. And, yeah, um, that was I've brilliant. got to give them a lot of credit because they're, they're much better than everyone when it comes to race director <laughs> and yeah. graphics. A period like what they're the oh yeah no the MotoGP graphics are beautiful really what nice. they offer and what the insight they give and they, they they don't focus on the I don't want to say BS but they don't focus on the pointless ones like closing or striking distance or whatever F1 have now the new one or closing because it's just not relevant they, they they do other types of graphics which are much more helpful so um for example let's say they've got a camera you know, for example recently we've got the camera shot with the halo looking at like this weekend looking at Vettel's eyes for example yeah yeah They've got the same thing equivalent in MotoGP with a camera looking at the rider's face, but they've put a, like a mirrored camera on there. So at the bottom of the screen, you can see what's at the front. So right. you can see both. So you can see his face and his helmet movement and everything and the leaning. Uh... But there's like a small box within a box camera at the bottom of the screen, which shows um, what's in front. So also where he's going and like who's overtaking. So you get that double sense of perspective. Like, it'd be sick if they put like on the halo the same camera on the other, st- on the other side, like a, looking forward. So yeah, you got both yeah. perspectives and they mirrored that because, again, you're adding depth and layers to, to the broadcast. Instead of putting a pointless graphic or striking distance, yeah. do something more cool with the cameras. They make did it more immersive. such a good job initially with all the graphics and everything, but I think it's time to for them to just kind of branch out a little bit more. I think they need to anyway because, you know, the um, you know how now the onboard T cameras have now got a wider lens. So yeah. it yep. and it looks so much better. It looks like looks like one of your career modes, Arav. Like how <laughs> far effort, you've yeah. had your camera yeah, back. zoomed out. <laughs> it looks like that. And but the problem is now is the uh, you know the Halo graphic like the with like the throttle inputs and brake yeah, inputs yeah. and gears doesn't fit anymore. No, <laughs> they, they don't actually watch. It, does. it doesn't they actually fit on the Halo. They don't use it. They don't use it anymore. No, I saw they do. The they do. They, they, they use it, it a bit it in um, okay. Singapore. I saw it the other day. But it. On, I think it, they were riding on board with Bottas and it just didn't fit at all. I was like, this is just a bit amateur. Well, it's only Bottas that has it, I think. I don't think Hamilton has it yet. No, I think the they're same. trying to trial it on more cars now. But um, yeah, with that introduced, then I think yeah, they do need to have, probably for next season, just have a look at, just enhance. I'm surprised actually with the picture-in-picture stuff that they've been reluctant because they've got F1 TV and they'd just be like, well, what if you want to go see other angles of F1, then pay for that. But we're all going to be like, no. Just improve your bloody broadcast in the first yeah, place, yeah, and actually show us all the action, please, rather than yeah. the leader going around the final sector, twindling around and seeing if Hamilton can overtake in the final sector. No, he can't. <laughs> it's the final <laughs> sector; he can't overtake there. So bugger yeah, it off. Exactly, yeah. There's no point. Um, can I also do a, a quick nod to McLaren again? Yeah, Lando Norris. Yeah. Finally, finally gets after <laughs> Spa. I was so butt hurt after Spa. Oh yeah, we have, yeah we didn't talk about about that with you. Yeah. Oh my god, I was so Tragedy. frustrated Tragedy. that that happened to him. It literally bit him in the backside. With um, if any of you guys have watched the or know of uh, when Verstappen, Norris, and two other drivers, I can't remember who did it. Uh, did the twenty four hours of Spa on yeah, the racing. racing thing. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> Verstappen's brake pedal broke on the final <laughs> lap, and they managed to survive and still win. And then that kind of bit him back in the arse to go, how are well, you not going to, you're not going to yeah. finish this one at least at Spa. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, fair play. Recently, and I was like, I said to Arav, I think we spoke about, obviously you've missed a few, but um, how many points McLaren have thrown away in the last three, four races and they're still oh, yeah. comfortably fourth, even with that Ricardo Hulkenberg good result in Monza. Like, you know, Norris in Spa, signs was like seventh at the start of the race in Singapore and he got taken out by Hulkenberg and obviously had to come back but didn't make the points. And um, I thought, I think also Monza, they were quite high up as well and something happened. I think it was signs, wasn't it? Oh, well, he had a tight wheel well, came off, yeah. Wheel came off, yeah. So literally, you, there's been so many this season, McLaren have lost points. I think, um, you know, you can just count them. There's more than just one hand's worth. And um, again, it just goes to show that that car is just, it's really good. Yeah, really good. Yeah, good. Yeah. They've got a really good baseline for next year, and uh, 
we mentioned it before, it's just good to actually see them solidify an actual upward trajectory, basically, in F1 now and uh, try and make progress back. And uh, we'll see. I mean, that fight's uh, McLaren at 89, Renault 67. I don't, I don't think they're really in trouble, like, like you say, Tom. That car is just so, no, so, I don't think they're in trouble so good. No, no. And really, the, really, the battle, interesting one, is like, you know, a little bit further down. So we've got Renault in 67, Torosso 55, Racing Point 46, Alfa Romeo 35, Haas 26. Uh, and Williams on one. Um, <coughs> but uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I I don't see Toro Rosso, even though Gassi had a great race, really, really happy for him in, the, in that Singapore GP. I don't know yep. if Toro Rosso is going to have the outright performance. I think they'll still get some small points here and there, but I think Renault will be able to do another Monza kind of race where they can get a big wall of points at, at some point later uh, to the end of the yeah. season. So I think Renault is trying to solidify that P5. So I reckon it's more a case of can Racing Point catch back up to Toro Rosso because they were nowhere in Singapore. Um... And can Alfa Romeo also catch it? Because Giovinazzi's gaining some momentum now, but Raikkonen's got very unlucky in the last, well, two out of the three races. Uh, well, yeah. no, actually, three out of three, because he got unlucky at Monza. Uh, Spy got taken out. Uh, Monza he got unlucky with the of it, well, his own doing of the crash, but then the gearbox change and all that stuff. And then, uh, what was it? Uh, in, then, obviously, the crash at Singapore. So he's also had a bad run, like Carlos Sainz, in the last I think three races. In general, like, if you analyse the midfield, I think in general, I mean, Haas haven't scored a point since the summer break. Uh, which is quite surprising. So Haas have taken the foot off the pedal. I think Racing Point have gone backwards. Toro Rosso have stepped up. I mean, yeah, like you say, our fair play to Gasly, really good result for him for get, to get in P8. And he, he seemed absolutely delighted with that. Uh, Alfa Romeo, and more importantly, Giovinazzi, has started to step on it a little bit, a little bit which is really good for Giovinazzi because obviously we're in silly season now, wondering where Hulkenberg is going to fit in, whether or not he goes to Williams, mm. whether or not he can go to Alfa Romeo. At the end of the day, Giovinazzi has really proven that he does does deserve that seat after a good solid string of um, uh, points finishes. What is it? I don't know whether he scored in Spa, but he definitely scored in uh, Monza. He was going to score in Spa. <laughs> he was going to, then he but, had that crash. But yeah, yeah, it's still, yeah, it's still good. And obviously, he has Ferrari's backing, so that plus the performances he's finally putting in, I think keep, it keeps. Exactly. I think that seat's safe for him. I think that Alpha think lineup's not going to change. I wanted to mention, so I said to Arab after the incident race reaction the other day, um... It's quite interesting with Alpha and Hulkenberg because I think we'll see how, how strong the Ferrari link is. Gio's picked up points at a good time, but the interesting story here is, and I said to Arav off, off air, Hulkenberg was, um, or Fred Vasseur was Hulkenberg's boss when he won the GP2 championship in 2009. He was oh, really? also the Renault team boss at the time when he signed Hulkenberg to Renault three years ago. And they're just quite close, generally, they're boys. So Vasseur is the current, obviously, team principal of Alfa Romeo right now. So right. it'd be interesting what would happen there. Vasseur, the other day, did say, you know, even though they're close and they get on really well, um, Gio has done really well. And he kind of backed Gio quite heavily. So I guess we'll see how much influence Freud have in that because I still think mm. there could be a strong link there and that could be quite interesting. Um, we did say, you know, him crashing at Spa might be pivotal, but luckily for Gio, he's picked up points in the last two races. So that's kind of taken the, yeah, you know, taken the I think dirt he's, I think he's erased that. And uh, I, yeah. I, I believe the Ferrari link's strong enough because the way they signed Raikkonen, uh, you know, you could tell by the meet, the way they worded the announcement, it was very clear that Raikkonen was their own signing, like their own doing of like, they, they went out and asked Kimi, do you want to sign? Do you want to drive for us? Yeah. And they were told that they were going to be losing Leclerc to Ferrari, not given a choice of that. So I think the Ferrari link, I think it's stronger than maybe you realize. I, I, I think from the, the way it was worded last year, it might have changed because obviously Leclerc was the hot shot. I don't think Gio's as hot of a shot as Leclerc was. Obviously, no. it might have been different back then. So now See, maybe, this is what maybe I mean. Ferrari have let off the pedal a bit. I don't know. With the Ferrari link, I'm like, yeah, okay, Ferrari, yeah, probably want to keep him in, but it's not to Ferrari's benefit because Ferrari aren't going to... I, I could easily see Ferrari keeping their lineup for at least four years until oh, yeah, Vettel yeah. retires. Yeah. So yeah, until that, Vettel that lineup's not moving. So it depends on Giovinazzi because I can happily see... I'd either see him, depending on how, how well he, he performs next season... There'll be a lot more pressure to get Mick Schumacher in if he impro- if he um, proves himself next year in F two, um, but the, but I, I think because I think there's a lot of pressure around there to get Mick into Formula One, yeah. Um, so that means either Geo does a sidestep or a backward step yeah. out of the sport. But to be fair, I think it makes sense for Hulkenberg just to go to Williams because. It, obviously, he came into the sport with Williams. I think it'd be quite nice for him to go back there. Yeah. But it's if they want to get Latifi, 
Yeah, at yeah. first and I was like, "What a weird mix." And but then I was like, "Oh wait, he came at Williams. Yeah, he started yeah. Williams." And I was like, "Oh wow." Yeah, it would work out, but I, I, I don't. I don't. Him don't, and Russell. The way taste. the way Hulkenberg said in pre, in press, very very confidently, like he doesn't mind if he's not in F one. Yeah. I think I think he's honestly like at that stage of his career now, and that just state of mind where he's like he just wants to enjoy racing, and he knows he's not going to enjoy being in Williams, so he may as well go do enjoy What's racing. What's mad is something. he came onto the grid in 2010 with Williams, like. Yeah. Next season will be his. Well, it's technically his tenth season. He, he's a proper it, veteran. Proper veteran. I guess it depends. Like obviously, Williams might be like, okay, listen, <laughs> let, let we'll show you what we've got for next season. You can make your mind up. You know, like we got we got a decent. I'm thinking car of the, here with a plank of wood. I'm thinking that of that of that meme where it's like slaps the car. Here we got this bad boy. <laughs> yeah. Or or for example, they could be like, okay, listen. Next year, we've got much going on, but for 2021, we've got this already going on. Like the you know this X Y Z. There's lots of ways you could lure him in. So, yeah, I agree. He didn't seem too fast. In other words, kind of hinting at, I don't want to drive a shit box. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. at the same time, I think that can be changed or you know, he can be persuaded into something else depending on what they have. So, you never know. I mean, the Williams surely can't be worse than this season. Surely? Surely not, no. I, I, I'm confident they actually won't because they, I mean, made, a big, made, a big they, they made a big anyway. step forward at Germany. So, I think they have actually discovered the right track for their car. So, the, the hope I is mean, they the, would They improve. are offloading Kubica who... I think, from my perspective, it looks like Kubica had made that decision himself to get himself no, out of Formula he, One. He, he said himself, he's yeah, yeah. He, he like, and I think he knows. He was like, "Well, there's no point in me rolling around at the back." Like Russell, there's a point for him because he's got a point to prove. He's just long career. getting F1. Experience. Yeah, he's got a long career ahead of him. Yeah, but Kubica in that sort of seat, nah. Yeah, it, nah. It, it, just, it, it was it was good for publicity. It was, and it was yeah. good for the fans. But it was it was a it was a it was a nice comeback story that he could actually get back in the car and get into get yeah, off the grid. Yeah, but yeah, now it's like, okay, cool, cool, just just leave it. <laughs> Just leave. Let's well, uh, put a damper on that. Basically, we'll see. I th- I'd like to see someone. I'd like to see someone like Hawkenberg push Russell. Mm. Yeah, because people Russell... say like Latifi, and I'm like, mm. I don't know whether Latifi's going to push him. I don't think he's going to ruffle any feathers. Whereas I think Hawkenberg could, but at the same time, does he want to drive? You know, shitbox. It depends mm-hmm. what 2021 saying. He that's, does. That's he does. Matters. But um. I think we'll uh, now head towards uh, prediction time, lads, uh, for the uh, Russian mm-hmm. GP to wrap this thing up here. We talked about how we thought we'd be fair, and uh, I think we're all kind of in the unknown, really. So it's just, at this point, potluck. I'm pretty sure our last few predictions have been woefully nowhere near it. Um, so well, let's... Just, yeah, so uh, let's just, um, just just go for it. Uh, start with pole position, uh, Tom Cowell. You want to go for, <laughs> for anyone? I don't, I don't know. Who, who? It's just potluck, isn't it? Lewis Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton. All right. Sebastian Tom? Vettel. I will go for a, I'll go for a difference. I'll say Charles Leclerc uh, for a pole nice. position. Uh, top five. Top five then. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Cause I don't I, like ever since. <laughs> don't the problem yeah. is, I just is don't like, know. <laughs> don't the problem is, is like Singapore has completely threw off my interpretation of the top three now. Yeah. Because yep. I thought Red Bull would be. Up there, I thought Mercedes would be dominated. Well, no, actually, I thought Red Bull would be the best. Mercedes second, Ferrari third. It's pretty much the complete opposite to that. So, mm. yeah, I agree. I mean, there's pressure on Red Bull as well to step up because Singapore is a. Pole I don't think they'll them. be that great at Russia though either. I want um, a good old fight between your boy Hamilton and Vettel, just like old days. I want. It's going to be Vettel, Hamilton, Leclerc, Bottas, ooh. Verstappen. Ooh. Oh, Leclerc, Vettel, Bottas, Verstappen, Albon. Hamilton has a problem with all the tyres on the race. I'm going to go with Hamilton wins it. I, re- I, reckon Le- I reckon the Ferrari might be good over one lap, but then Merck will have that race pace because they've always generally gone well, Russia, over Ferrari. So I'm going to go Hamilton. I'll say Leclerc, Vettel, Bottas... And Verstappen, and then yeah, Albon, probably P6. Then um, yeah, I don't think Bottas will do anything spectacular. I don't like I said. I don't. I don't think he'll be paid back. I think that was a flat out lie from Sir James on the radio. <laughs> Best of the rest predictions. Um, that's... well, bearing in mind that Albon will finish sixth. Yeah, I would say Albon. P- I'm going to go Albon P6, P7. I'm going to go with Carlos Sainz. Finally, gets back on the horse after so much bad luck. Uh, P8. Uh, P8. You know what? Racing point might be okay around there. 
So Sergio Perez, P8, P9, Norris, P10, Ricardo. Renault might go well as well. All right, I'll go Science, Norris, Ricardo, Raikkonen. I said Hamilton would have a bad race, therefore fifth is going to be... No, wait, sixth, sixth. sorry. You sixth mean is sixth, going yeah. to be, yeah. I'm also going to say signs. I'm going to say Norris seventh. I think McLaren are due a strong double finish. Double one again. They can't. They can't get both cars. And on the topic of bounce backs, I think I want to give Raikkonen a P8, Ricardo a P9, and I'll give Kvyat a P10 because he's home race and he needs to bounce yeah. back. <laughs> Russian propaganda comes through. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, th- I think it will be, I actually think about it, it will be, I think it will be a very close fight once again with, with the midfield, which would be really great. I think Renault, um, Renault went well in a straight line They're at, funny at Monza. Team. They just... Yeah, they are a funny team. So I think it's Renault have potential team. to be right up there with, you know, battling um, Racing Point and um, battling McLaren, sort of, uh, if, you know, they have a little bit of uh, bad luck in the race, perhaps. Um, so I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a good fight there. I don't expect much at the top end, even though it's looking close again and Ferrari surging, it's just the Russian GP, isn't it? So I just, I just have that. I just have that distrust. We're no one mentioned Haas in this one. The are in agreement here. No, yeah, no. <laughs> Look, I, it's been a joke. I've been watching the last three races with Niran, my flatmate here, and every single time we just look at each other and go, yeah. So they're there in P8 and 9 right now on lap number one. So they're going to be what <laughs> P18 and 19 by the yeah, cool. Okay, sound because they just they what a bad season. They just. Yeah, they, they they just can't work their tires at all. So it's literally like you get to about a third through the race, it's like, oh, it's time for the Haas to go down the order. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I don't think anyone, none of us even mentioned that. I don't think anyone, neither of us contemplated it, did we, in our minds no. about them being in the top ten? So ha- no. Haas who? <laughs> Rich Energy. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, no. by the way, did you two see that? Rich Energy tweeted oh, my <laughs> a screenshot me. of the ass crashing into the Williams. <laughs> oh my god. I it, thought this whole thing had stopped. It no. just keeps giving. It just keeps giving. It's just too when amazing. You thought it yeah. couldn't get any worse. I'm here to tell you it has. It was amazing. I was like, this can't this is not real. They're not even sponsoring them anymore. And they're still oh, tweeting no. about saltiness about them. Oh, amazing right amazing Brilliant story big up yourself this year's uh, this year's had some banter had some it's had some top tier banter off circuit it really has but <laughs> been a proper banter <laughs> yeah i think uh, i think we'll end it off there lads yeah uh, for the uh, yeah, for yeah. the podcast and uh, we'll catch you i think hopefully after the russian gp next week for a uh, for an actual podcast there won't be an instant race reaction because i am away but uh, there will be an actual podcast later on in the week uh, so we'll catch you guys then. If you did enjoy this one, though, be sure to hit like a button. Let us know what you thought about any of that discussion we had. Get involved in the conversation about Ferrari v Merck and let us know your predictions for the Russian GP below. If you are new around here, do subscribe to this channel for the podcast. You can check us out on Audio, SoundCloud, Spotify, and iTunes. And also you can check out these guys on screen. Twitter handles have been on the entire time. And if you do want to directly support us, you can check us out on Patreon or GT Omega. If you fancy yourself getting a racing chair and you use the code PITLANEF1 at checkout, they'll directly kick back to us. If you do use that uh but that's been it then from us three finally after a long while we apologize for the delay but we're back hopefully for some more consistent podcasts in the future so till the next one guys hope you enjoy the rest of your day goodbye <laughs>